Hello, and welcome to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners here at Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team here at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We are so glad you're here. In the spotlight session, More Insights' Patrick Moorhead is joined by Samuel Nafziger, AMD Senior Vice President, Corporate Fellow, and Product Technology Architect. Their conversation centers on trends in power consumption for processors and systems and what promising solutions that are in development to help meet this challenge. This is a timely conversation and one I'm pretty sure you don't want to miss. Let's go check it out. We want to thank Accenture for sponsoring the semiconductor track of this year's 6.5 Summit. Sam, it's great to see you again, and thank you so much for talking here at the 6.5 Summit 2022. I know this is going to be a, a great adder to the semiconductor track. We're excited to be here, Pat. You know, I know uh, I've got some big shoes to fill. Uh, since my CEO was the last guest at, at your summit from AMD, but uh, I've got some uh, really exciting content here that I, I look forward to sharing around the energy efficiency challenge that I think is probably the biggest uh, uh, thing that we're going to have to deal with in our industry over the next decade. Yeah, Sam, uh, you and I both worked at AMD uh, the same time when I was there. And even back in 2003, uh, we were talking about power efficiency with Opteron. And in fact, we put a, a you save this much power and this much money uh, up in uh, Times Square uh, during, that, uh, during the launch of, of the product. And I know you have been front and center, and, and it was one thing for me to talk about that power efficiency and even even today talking about power efficiency but you're actually engineering uh this 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 capability so what makes you think though that things are different now and that there's really a looming energy challenge uh, on the horizon yeah no that's um that's great because that's the background I'd, I'd love to go through and you know, I've spent, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the last 16 years uh, at AMD and we, we overlap there and, and power technology has been a primary area of ownership for me. And now I work across all our product lines, deploying and selecting the best technologies that make for the most efficient, highest performance, just all around best products. And so that forces me to study the underlying physics, the trends, what drives performance, and see what's uh, what's happening in in the future across our industry and, and the technology landscape. So, you know, going to why this is is uh, you know, a bigger challenge than it has been in the past, and it's it's being fundamentally driven by a culture of more, I would say. And, and the culture of more is, is coming out of the benefits that people are garnering from all of the technology that we've been designing. They've really um, become dependent on it. We all have for navigation, for you know, our, our uh, video sharing and editing and, and all of the things that we don't see that go on in, out in the cloud, voice recognition with Siri. And it, it's just a pervasive aspect of our life and all of that requires a lot of computation. So the demand for these computes is just not abating. And you know, as, as this graph shows, the server uh, performance is a perfect proxy because these are the things that sit out there in, in the cloud and do the work that we all depend, um, whether it's you know, financial transactions or, or image recognition and stuff. And these have been seeing the historical exponential growth uh, that's been going on for decades, and it's continuing. <clears throat> it's uh, up and to the right, and it's this sort of annual uh, improvement that we become dependent on. If we don't deliver these kinds of gains, then the expectations for the next generation of features just aren't going to be met, people aren't going to upgrade, and, and the capabilities we need aren't going to be there. So this exponential improvement, which uh, is often correlated to Moore's law, has been a, a critical aspect and, and we've, our industry depends on it. Now, the, the problem that is much uh, discussed is that the fundamental physics of Moore's law is, um, is running into serious headwinds. 
the technology nodes are slowing down in introduction just because they're so hard to develop. We have uh, billions of dollars in R&D and the best and the brightest on the planet working on this stuff. But all those PhDs are um, still uh, coming up short of the historical no norms for process scaling. And you know, as shown in the, the little chart on the right there, the density gains generationally, the nodes are slower at inter in introduction, but also the density gains we get are less and they're varying by component. And kind of the fundamental part of Moore's law that we depend on is that density improvement and it doesn't just give us smaller chips or more gates in the chip. It, it enables lower energy per operation because you get things closer together and smaller. It's intuitive, right, that there's less power required to, to get them to operate. So this uh, it represents a serious concern and, and a, um, an issue in meeting that exponential growth. And the, the power demands, uh, as shown here, are a corollary to that slowdown colliding with the growth in performance. So if we aren't getting the energy improvements from our base technology, but we're still having to deliver the performance, it's just going to take more energy to get the work done. And, and unfortunately, we are seeing a, a serious uptick in the thermal design power uh, focusing in on the CPU server example. And that means it's it's a lot more watts in the system, a lot more heat generated to do the computations. And, and so to you know wrap up the answer here on um, you know why do I see this as a problem that the the biggest issue is or the, the question is are we still getting more work done per joule consumed? And the uh, the reality is that improvement curve is tailing off as shown here. So we can just simply plot the performance per watt of our servers. And the performance is still going up, <clears throat> which the market and, and all the world requires, but we're just taking more watts per unit of performance. It's kind of like, you know, in, if you drive an EV, <clears throat> um, EVs are great, but when you start driving into a headwind, your range starts uh, starts tailing off. And, and so this is a lot like driving our compute performance into a headwind. We need bigger and bigger batteries just to get the miles to reach our destination. Yeah, I loved your I loved your opening. And, and I think it's not only a culture of more, it's a culture of more and now. Right. Particularly when I look at uh, millennialism and, and Gen Z. Uh, coming in and we want more and and we want it and we want it faster. Uh, I love the charge that you showed and it really does paint a very sobering picture as it relates to servers. I mean, I can't believe uh, we're at 400 watts uh, right now for for a, a, a TDP of a of a two piece server. That is astronomical. Um, and you know the curve of the amount of work we're getting done is not necessarily getting any better. In fact, it looks like it's 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 getting work. But you know, CPU servers are one thing, but you know, the IT industry is a multi-trillion-dollar industry. And I'm curious what what maybe the other trends look like in in some of these other segments, maybe like GPUs or or something like that. And you know, it's funny uh, uh, as a follow-up to that. I mean, you know, if you look at what Bill Gates talked about with 640k of memory is everything we always needed. Reminds me a little bit of you know we'll only need three computers uh, in the in the in the entire uh, world and you know others said that the giga wars gigahertz wars are over. By the way, I said that in uh, in the year two thousand one, uh, and it's more about performance. But it kind of seems like aren't processors uh, already faster than than anyone needs? And you know most of these statements are are inaccurate. But do you, do you think we will ever hit the point where statements like this? will become a reality because it looks like we're about to hit a wall here and then really the innovation moves to more of software and applications and you know computation becomes essentially a commodity yeah well that that is the big question and you know you and i've been in this industry long enough to uh, have made some of those statements and heard some of those statements that have been proven wrong over time and and you know, the, there is the culture of more and the fact that the world is is now addicted to uh, the gains we get from uh, IT improvements. 
but there are also a lot more things, a lot more improvements, benefits to society driving the continued growth that I do not think will ever uh, abate in the foreseeable yeah. future unless uh, they hit an immovable object. And, you know, a, a good example is the scientific computing domain. Um, so, you know, here is just the top 500, you know, uh, number of uh, flops for the supercomputers. And it's been going on exponentially, um, doubling much faster than Moore's law uh, for, for decades. And it's not just to get the bragging rights uh, for the top spot, although um, we won't turn that down. And uh, AMD's super proud of uh, breaking the X-flop barrier with our uh, Frontier supercomputer deployment. But the um, these things are used for critical uh, capabilities for the benefit of, of humanity, right? Um, you know, climate modeling and genome sequencing, drug discovery, all these things that have a boundless appetite for computation. And they, they really uh, impact people's lives. And, you know, protein folding calculations for uh, disease prevention, you know, those are, um, have just vast demands for compute and, and we're not even close to being able to do them uh, accurately. So. Supercomputing is one area um, that is just not abating. And then, you know, completely different one, but similar underpinning technology is in the gaming space. And, and we've all seen with uh, lockdowns and such just how, how people have immersed themselves in gaming. Esports has become, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar spectator uh, event. Yeah. And people, you know, once again, they, they get addicted to the photorealistic capabilities, ray trace, lighting, to faster frame rates, and just the, the immersive experience of gaming. And it, it's, um, you know, it's more than just an individual hold up in his basement. The thing that has transformed it is the interactive nature of all the online uh, gaming, you know, connected and meeting people around the world and interacting with them. And and it, it has to be a realistic immersive experience. And, and that is, it requires a ton of compute. And we are not even close to uh, reaching the levels of realism that that people would really want to see, right? So the you know this drives a flop growth, uh, you know another exponential here in in game requirements, and probably the mother of all workloads, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the the killer app, if you will, you know the thing that that disproves uh, you know three computers is enough is the growth of machine learning. Um, and, and what we're seeing here is just an astonishing increase in compute demand that's uh, doubling in a matter of months rather than in years. And, and of course, you know, this is an exponential that certainly can't last forever, but uh, it's been going on for several years now. And, um, you know, we're in this industry all, all working on meeting uh, the demand several years out <laughs> based on these trends. And the reason these things are getting so huge is once again, they're feeding the culture of more. They're meeting very real felt needs by um, by the by all of our, all of our, um, our population. Things like uh, you know language translation capabilities. I mean, you and I travel a lot, right? And so uh, the the ability to translate language real time when you're overseas, or you know, photograph a foreign menu and and then read the translated text, you know transformative capabilities, but they require a lot of compute. They require these huge uh, billion or trillion parameter networks to perform that recognition function off in the cloud somewhere. And you got to train those models and training those models takes days and weeks on these, you know, gigantic compute systems. So the, um, the demand isn't going away and it all, it all takes, uh, energy. And so that brings me to, you know, the, the final <laughs> slide in this section, which is the trends in energy use. And the Semiconductor Research Council did a great bit of work here showing the um, the growth over time of energy demand and and the fact that these compute trends are, are, are going to have IT equipment consuming a very large chunk of the world's energy unless we figure out how to do things differently. So it's... Uh, um, it's something that's going to require a completely new set of solutions. Uh, when I first saw this slide uh, in the green room, I stared at it uh, because I had never seen uh, anything like this before. But it actually, it makes perfect sense. You know, we casually talk about trillions of devices on the edge. Well, guess what? Those trillion devices on the edge consume power, but they also have to be orchestrated and managed by a bunch of edge compute, a bunch of data center, hyperscalers, and 
um, all of that has to be trained in, in some sort of machine learning uh, model. So that's amazing. Could be 75% of all of the energy consumed is from uh, electronics and uh, semiconductors. So actually compute. And that's that's pretty daunting. So you can you've convinced me uh, that 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 yes, uh, we we have a challenge. And you know you you alluded to new approaches uh, must be found. So you know I'll hit you straight up. What are these new approaches? And do you think they'll be sufficient to to meet this incredible energy demand? Yeah. So um, well, do I think? They'll be sufficient. I, I have a lot of confidence in the ability of our industry and our engineers to innovate. So I, I think we will find a way. And so let me walk through what, yeah, I think some of those approaches are going to be, although um, certainly uh, neither I nor, nor anyone else knows exactly how we're going to put all this together to meet the demand. But but starting at what we need to do differently, um, this, this plot here you know, shows the trends in efficiency of a general purpose CPU. And this is why that CPU server performance per watt curve is bending over, because uh, th this is a real simple chart, once again, from the uh, Semiconductor Research Council, and it just shows the energy on the x-axis and the work done on the y. And, and sure, as, as you do more work, you know, your, your y-axis goes up, it requires more energy, the problem with this chart is that the empirical data from way back in 1971 to 2020 follows a, a, a surprisingly consistent trend that shows that we need to switch a lot more bits, in other words, consume a lot more energy to get a unit of work done, the more performant our processors are. So that's what this says, and it, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's, you know, it's an exponentially decaying return on investment. <laughs> And CPU performance. One to one, if we had scaled at one to one from 1971, we'd be a million times more energy, energy efficient today than we are now. So that 400 watt server, you know, it'd be less than a watt, right? If it were perfectly <laughs> energy efficient. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, that this is why general purpose compute is um, a, as valuable as it is, it's just intrinsically inefficient. And um, so we're gonna have to do things differently and and so that's where you know we can look to gpus are they more efficient mm -hmm. and and the um the to answer that question we really have to get to the performance per watt curve right but you you know you can look at um the flop rates it's been following an almost identical curve to the cpu side and you know doubling uh flop rates floating point operation rates every uh, couple years or so so um, huge demand for these, for gaming, for compute. <clears throat> the power consumption uh, looks like, uh, you know, deja vu all over again here, um, a serious uptick in recent years. So meeting that demand, we're, we're throwing more power into our systems. And I think we see this as um, even, you know, gaming uh, notebook cards are coming out at, at 450 watts plus. Not notebook cards, <laughs> desktop. <laughs> 450 watt notebook, that would be. That would be, um, uh, that'd be big. <laughs> the, um, but then, you know, the, the million dollar question here is, are, are GPUs actually more efficient? And the uh, encouraging answer here is that just looking at floating point operations, not, not delivered, um, you know, workloads. The, the CPU plot was more of a second rate, which is representative of real workloads. But if we look at floating point operations, we're still doing pretty darn good. We're, yeah. we're, we're continuing that improvement curve. So, we, we can drive the fundamental atoms of compute uh, to higher efficiencies over time. Now, I, um, I, I do expect this curve to tail off due to the physics that I mentioned earlier. But this gives us a hint that these kinds of special purpose devices um, can keep the efficiency gains going longer. And, and so that's where the, uh, the special purpose accelerator uh, architecture has become a real interesting direction. Yeah, it is funny how we've, uh, you know, I had my head going, hey, we're all going ASICs, baby. Here we go. We're going to push everything on to the, uh, everything on to the software developer. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to be really slow uh, as an industry and we're going to be locked in because, you know, ASICs, ASICs might be uh, efficient, but they really lock you in uh, more uh, than not. Um, specifically on the 
GPU, I, I find that fascinating. It is good to see that at least on uh, floating point, it, it looks pretty good. But, you know, GPUs are are a pretty mature architecture now. And but but do you think that and therefore, do you think that it will um, flatten on the efficiency curve like you showed with the CPUs uh, two or three uh, questions ago? And and if the answer is yes, is there any other technology or architecture that can keep uh, these gains uh, going? Yeah, well, I, yeah, the, the, the physics of process scaling are going to result in even uh, GPUs slowing down on that efficiency curve. Yeah. Now, the, um, the, the answer to that second part of the question is, you know, are there, are there ways, you know, so the, G, the move from a CPU to a GPU did produce a, a, a nice efficiency improvement. What's the next step in that continuum? And, and really, we are going to have to, you know, not necessarily an ASIC, but, um, you know, that there, there's a, a better answer that I'll get to in a bit, I think. That oh, wait a second. So I may have gotten in the, I, I'm, maybe I'm partially right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing this a while, Pat. So I think, yeah, I think you see um, the opportunities, but, but we do have to solve that programmability problem. And yes. the, um, we have to retain the general purpose capabilities or else people won't be able to access the performance. Yeah, our but, time, uh, time to market will just shift out, I mean, exponentially, and we might get the energy, but it, it's going to be years after we actually needed it. Right. Right. So what we're um, what we're seeing, though, is that we're, we're just being forced into the mode of, uh, you know, as this conceptual chart shows, using more at domain specific uh, architectures. The general purpose CPU, as convenient as it is and ubiquitous, uh, easy to program, it's just not sufficiently uh, efficient to meet the world's compute demand uh, in the future. Uh, GPUs are doing a lot better. We've uh, figured out in large part how to, how to program them, and we have some very sophisticated software stacks and, and making rapid progress there on enabling easy offloads to these more parallel devices. And the uh, the it's a continuum where for a narrower set of applications, we can go to more special purpose accelerators and they are just intrinsically uh, more efficient. The the other big key I think we're we're going to require is around uh, package innovation that enables us and, and you know, I'll get to this a bit, but we've got to be able to integrate these uh, domain specific architectures efficiently together. And, and that means we're, we're going to be splitting up our die into smaller components so that we can have uh, application specific acceleration for, for given market segments and, and a different mix for other segments. And if we're going to enable that, we can't have a lot of overhead communicating between these chiplets. And, and so the, uh, the 3D stacking is going to be a, a huge enabler for these architectures of the future to have heterogeneous compute where the, uh, we have low overhead, low energy um, connectivity. So I see that as a really big opportunity. And, and they're, you know, these, these things are going to transform the way we design these processors. Yeah, so I'm learning a lot uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, I definitely was dialed in to the specialty of, of compute, but I didn't actually know that you could get that modularity uh, through either tiles or chiplets could actually help in in energy efficiency. I had I had no uh, idea, so I've learned a lot there. Uh, well, let me let me maybe I can jump in there, and you know I'm kind of uh, enamored of our of what we call a VCash solution, which is yeah. a little diagram I showed, and the um what we did there is that little tile you see on the top yes is is a uh, special purpose cache chip and all it does is store bits as densely and in as low power way as it can and it sits on top of the cpu compute die below well the what we were able to do on that little tile is pack in twice as many bits per millimeter squared as we we um, as anyone can in a more general purpose CPU cache down below because that CPU cache down below has to have all the control the interface circuitry and all the wires to shuttle the bits around. Yeah. That that cache expander die, all it does is store bits and send them down through the vertical through silicon vias. So we ended up with you know a a, a very low energy pathway from that denser SRAM down 
and we get 20, 30 percent uh, accelerations in performance for virtually no power by going to this 3D. Now, it is domain specific because not everything needs a big cache, but there's a lot of workloads out there that really do. And, and so, yeah, this is a, a great example of. Um, I appreciate you. I, I should have known. Yeah, you don't have to go to the memory bus. It's right there. So that's the, the uniquely 3D capable, right? If you tried to triple the cache and get that 30% performance on a 2D form factor, you'd have to go millimeters away, spend a bunch of energy shuttling the bits back and forth. Yeah, so you talked about uh, 3D vCache, you talked about CDNA and RDNA, GPU architectures. Do you have any other uh, examples you, you can share of how specialization can improve efficiency? Yeah, so let me jump into a few that I see, you know, really uh, promising and, and show that, I mean, there's a software implication and, you know, it's going to take a lot of innovation, but big opportunities. So, you know, one of them is just around the precision we use to do calculations. And we've, we've been traditionally using these IEEE formats and they're great. They're like the gold standard. They're like the general purpose CPU, you know, they, they can do everything. You don't have to think about it. Um, but they, uh, they're overkill for a lot of applications. They're great for, you know, climate modeling. They're great for collision detection in your, your car. But if you're just doing audio you're balancing in the cabin or you know, you're um, asking Siri for a weather update, that doesn't need 64-bit math calculations, right? And so we can get by with many fewer bits for a lot of these computations that the world's using computers for. And so there's been a lot of great research going on in these uh, alternate precision uh, arithmetic formats and how far they can be pushed and applied. And in the machine learning space in particular, there's been a lot of work, you know, way down on the bottom end of this chart around 16-bit or even 8-bit formats that uh, are good enough for uh, the, the calculations we need. And so how much of a benefit is that, you might ask? Well, one simple example is here with uh, size of the multiplier required to uh, to do the calculations with these math formats. You know, the, the gold standard 64-bit, it's got 52 bits of mantissa. Well, multiplier area goes as the square of the number of bits, right? So you go down to 32 bits, it's a, a lot better, about a fifth the size, but if you can get down to these much smaller, tighter form, form factors, you're, um, you know, more than a, a factor of 50 smaller obviously much lower power, much lower area. And for a ton of applications, it's good enough, right? So there's gonna be a lot of work here and the way we use the binary bits to do the calculations that people need. Yeah, it's good to see people starting to get on the bandwagon and real implementations of things like uh, BFLOAT 16. Uh, and those are huge efficiency gains. I had no idea uh, that 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 was uh, the case, but you definitely have to do things differently because we got really comf comfortable with FP32, FP64, because we had been doing them for, for so long. And that's why we built it into, into, into everything. But it sounds like, though, we're going to have to change the way that we do things with future architectures. And I'd like to hear what, you know, what you have to say about that. What will these future architectures look like? Just to uh, clo close out this session. Yeah, well, it, it's going to be a lot different than the nice homogeneous architectures that we've gotten used to, um, which is you know exciting and daunting at the same time. So it, it, it's going to be also a much more multidisciplinary future where we're going to have to be bringing together, you know, we, we touched on packaging technology there a little bit and 3D stacking. Well, that's that's a whole different set of skills and constraints than traditional silicon design. And what we're seeing, you know, at AMD is that our package engineers, package experts, they have a uh, front seat at the table as we define future products because the way we integrate these different modular components and chiplets is very tied to the underlying package technology. Then we are working with the software guys because they have to, <laughs> they have legacy libraries and code they have to support. And we can't just invent hardware willy nilly, um, you know, as you've already hinted at, but we've got to do things differently with new number formats with domain specific architectures. 
and then then connect them together in ways that are actually usable and so the connecting together is where we get to you know modular design and every market will need a different mix of accelerator capabilities that's you know cpus you know i keep saying they're they're great because they can do do everything right they just don't do anything especially well <laughs> um and going forward so we we need to take those cpus and pair them up with stuff that's really good at doing particular tasks and the and the right mix of those domain specific accelerators is going to vary market to market so the companies that have the vision and the cross disciplinary skills to understand how to connect these um, how to work with the industry to establish standards on connectivity and and how then to integrate them with um, leading edge package technology is, is going to have a huge advantage in the in the future as we uh, work to overcome these energy challenges. So Sam, um, this is the most interesting conversation I've had on energy and and semiconductors. I don't I don't I don't say that lightly just because you know you're on uh, our stage here, but even I can understand uh, what you said. And, you know, as you know, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have an engineering uh, background. And I think it's important for everybody, even if you don't have an engineering degree or are not a, a technical fellow, to understand and appreciate where we're headed because it really is going to dictate uh, our, our future. And with technology, uh, being such a part of the fabric of our lives every day, uh, we better get this right. And I'm glad we have people like you on the case, and I'm glad we have companies like uh, AMD on the case. So uh, I appreciate uh, you coming on and 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 thank you. We'd, we'd love to have you next year too. Super fun to be here, Pat. And you know, I I, I just love innovating. I love technology challenges, and I guess you know, most gratifying is that we really are making people's lives better. You know, we're providing the capabilities to solve the world's hardest problems. And the fact that we have to, you know, innovate on in new dimensions, physics and metallurgy and software library routines, you know, that just makes it more exciting. So yeah, really good to talk about it. Thanks again.